Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you who have not seen me, my name is Andre Vanderhoek. Um, I am the department chair for the Department of Informatics. Um, and that's particularly welcome to all our new students who, who are here, and I recognize some of them. Um, I, uh, tradition is uh, that I give a state of the department, which, which sounds awfully ominous, but I like to treat it more of a celebratory event, um, to the start of the quarter and give you a little bit of an update um, as to where the department is, what some of the news is that's been going around, um, some of the things that we've seen happen in the past year, and where I see us actually focus in the upcoming year with our efforts. So, you know, last year we said we're going to focus on recruiting, and sure enough, we all had lots and lots of interview talks coming by, um, and you'll see what, we, what our focus will be um, this year. I welcome questions throughout, always, um, and uh, afterwards as well, and, and keep in mind afterwards there is a social hour down from the fifth floor, this is the first talk in a much longer seminar series where weekly we're here in uh, 6011, have a talk, and then we go downstairs and actually um, kind of celebrate nearly the end of the week. Um, so. so in any case, let me get going. Um, it's Usually this is the structure that's there. Um, I like to start with some campus and school news, then some department news, as I said, accomplishments and what's, what's ahead. So campus news, we continue to get lots of accolades. Um, so we are now the seventh ranked public university in US News and World Report. It used to be in the top 10, now we're seventh, so we're moving up slightly. Third best public university according to Money Magazine, top 10 cool school for nine years running, which really focuses on sustainability practices. Um, and so for nine years running, we've either been at the top or in sort of the top three, top four, um, which is an amazing piece of recognition, I, I find. And, and shows values of the university. Number one university doing the most for the American dream, sort of upward mobility of students coming in, at the, especially the undergraduate level, um, at, you know, who might be first to college, um, who might be coming from families that are poor, and actually are having the opportunity to build careers uh, for themselves. Um, and number four, best value college. And, and so these are just some of them, there's others. Um, there's millions and millions of rankings. If you go poke and you can find lots of rankings where you're number one and where you're 1,275. Um, <laughs> but these are sort of the more recognized ones. And it, it's sort of really a testimony to the university um, as it continues to grow and as it continues to establish itself that it is where it is after it, essentially 50 years. Um, so other things that are happening is UCI is now designated what's called a Hispanic serving institution, which means that a quarter of its students um, at the undergraduate level, identify as Hispanic, and also that half of the students actually receive financial aid. Um, so that's just one of the things to think about is how many students are actually coming in when you're GAing, for instance, right? How many students are coming in from a background that might not be mine? Um, and how many students are coming in, you know, just making things, getting by just so, right? So um, the population is one that, that we're proud of because we're serving them, but it's also one that we actually should be mindful of as we have them in um, UCI already was an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution. So, so point is, there's a, there's a big, um, diverse population coming through our university in general. Um, other things, applied innovation, which is uh, the entity in the university that forms the link between the corporate world and the university, uh, was established a number of years ago with lots of fanfire um, over in the University Research Park. Um, it has outgrown its, what, I think 60,000 square feet and it's actually moving into a new building because um, there's just an awful lot of activity that's happening, an awful lot of companies that are, that are selling themselves and a whole bunch of other kinds of things. So, it's moving and become larger. It will yet have more, for those of you who have been there, it will yet have more big screen TVs printed all over the place because that's what it's like. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in commercializing something or interacting with corporations, et cetera, talk to your advisor and talk to us um, how you can get involved there. The other one is the Anteater Learning Pavilion is open. Um, so to, the campus is short on classrooms. Um, and I think we all have been feeling that more or less in one way or another way, trying to schedule. Um, finding ourselves walking way across campus to find you know, a place to, to teach. Um, the Learning Pavilion is a new building, all classrooms, but what's particularly exciting is it's lots of active learning classrooms, so classrooms that we can reconfigure, that we can move tables around, move chairs around, and students can do lots and lots of group work. There's some requirements for, how to, you know, for teaching in there, but it is there, um, and I know that some of our faculty are actually teaching in it now um, and are quite excited. And so it, it alleviates some of the pressure, but still there's lots and lots of undergrads coming through, so scheduling still maintains something that is quite difficult. 
Um, construction has started on the new building uh, for physics, engineering, and ICS. ICS has a small sliver of this building, but still it will help um, as ICS continues to grow, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, that is a place that some people actually will be able to sit. The um, building is going to be right there. All the faculty who used to park there are very upset because now I've got to walk twice as far. Um, <laughs> all the students, of course, have no sympathy because they got to walk four times as far already. Um, so, but it's happening. It will take about two years for completion, is my understanding. Um, the Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation is an interesting resource. The campus has always had some set of people working on instructional technology and sort of helping people in the classroom. Um, over the past couple of years, this has really expanded significantly. Um, it used to more or less focus on uh, faculty. There's now a lot more resources available also for grad students for help. How do I run my session or how do I run my discussion or can somebody actually look at what I'm doing because I feel like something isn't quite going right. Um, so, so look at this website if you, if you have a chance and actually see if there's, you know, if, if you feel like you could use some help. Um, either talk to your advisor or your professor that you're working with, but also uh, keep in mind that there are seminars and trainings and other kinds of things that are available there. Um, and this is becoming more and more active. And actually the um, vice chancellor who, who runs that is actually was one of the driving forces behind um, the anterior learning pavilion. So, um, and then student campus growth is slowly starting to level off. Um, the campus had a growth plan in place where we added students regularly. Um, we're slowly but surely sort of topping off. Who knows what the next plan says, how many more we want to add or not. Um, but that has some implications of sort of how budgets get distributed among schools and the campus is, is looking at that. Um, but still, there's still plenty of students as you'll see um, in just a little bit, and actually just right now. Um, so if you look at the number of total freshman applicants last year, it was 95,000. Um, and that was 10,000 more applicants than the year before, which, which is a crazy number. Um, I, I don't know why people keep applying to a place that <laughs> has that many people coming already. Um, but of course, it all has to do with the reputation of UCI, of course, and many other things. So out of those 95, 27,000 uh, were admitted and about 6,000 accepted. And all the numbers and parameters are numbers that are last year's numbers. So in, in throughout the slides, if you see parameters, those are last year's numbers. So 10,000 more, fewer were admitted, um, and a few fewer were actually, actually accepted, and that was part of the campus's plan. Last year we had a little snafu, and we had a lot more students joining the campus than had anticipated. Um, so there was a, a concerted effort to be a little bit lower. Um, transfer students, same story. Uh, 2,000 additional transfer students who applied. Um, fewer that got accepted, and about 2,750, or fewer that got admitted, and 2,760 that actually showed up. Um, so it says a total of, you know, roughly 8,700 students joining us, 8,800 students joining us this year. And that's a big operation. That's a lot of students. Um, and a lot of those students are actually coming to ICS, one way or the other, to our school. And I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. So it means there's about 35,000 students this fall. Um, that's my estimate based on sort of numbers that are going on. About 29,000 undergrads, 2,700 masters and professional master's students, and about 3,300 PhD students um, overall across the campus. So a lot. Um, moving on from sort of the campus, where as compared to previous years, things, things seem to be in, in a, a steady state. No $200 million gift here or $70 million gift here. For just a little while, we're hoping they come back. Um, moving on to the school, and sort of if, if I talk about what happened at the school last year, it was recruiting, 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 and that's sort of the only thing that I remember. Um, so there were lots of recruitments across statistics, across computer science, across um, informatics. And so we all were busy interviewing folks, um, inviting them out, talking to them, making selections, recruiting them to hopefully join us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a big part of what happened at the school level. Um, but there's other things that's happening as well. So ICS is going to be 50 years old, actually is 50 years old. There's going to be a celebration on October 16th um, where lots of alumni are coming back um, and where there will be um, talks and panels and other kinds of things. Um, and so that celebration is, is nice and important. There's also operational changes. Um, so the way the school is allocating budgets to the departments is changing. Um, and so this is something that I as chair deal with and something that I as chair, you know, have to adjust to depending on, you know, what those changes are. So far, they've all more or less been good, so I've actually been quite happy. Um, but it does mean that we have to adjust how we run the department and, and what we do with the money that comes in. 
Um, and at the same time, also, the school is undergoing some transformations in its staff. For instance, one of the things that is important to the school is fundraising. Um, and so the fundraising operation is being redone to a degree, not completely, um, to have more people dedicated in, within the school um, and dedicated to the school to actually do this kind of effort. And, and we, we already have, over the past eight years that I've been chair, seven years I've been chair, um, we've gone from one person to probably now five or six that are going to be here total um, working with us, maybe four or five. But um, it's important that we're actually starting to see payoff of that. Um, so we're starting to see things that are happening now that didn't used to happen seven years ago. Um, and so some fellowships are coming about, some larger support is coming about, um, which is all good for the school in, in many, many ways. Um, and that sort of goes directly also to corporate partners. Um, so the school has been building its corporate partners program um, where corporations sign up to you know, donate some money, um, but then also get some services from the school. And we're, as a department, we're a big participant in this because we run a lot of project classes, and I'll return to that in a little bit, where the companies typically will furnish one or two projects that our undergrads work on or our master's students work on um, in the professional programs. And so um, we see a lot more corporate activity around us. We see a lot more recruiting around us because, again, um, not unlike you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, student demand is very high or the demand for students is very high out of the corporate world. Um, and so they're coming more directly to the universities to try to sort of intercept the students early. <laughs> and then this is a little bit more of a faculty than, than everybody in the audience, but there is a program forthcoming out of the uh, school that's called the Research Incentive Grants. Um, and so there's gonna be one time significant funding, my understanding is about 250 to 300. Two times decent funding, no more than 15, maybe 75, and four times smaller funding um, that are for sort of interdisciplinary research projects um, amongst faculty within the school, amongst faculty outside the school, um, to which uh, we can apply, so faculty, remember, um, but also to which, and Paul's looking at me like outside the school is not true, or we're good? Mm. Good. Mostly inside school. Inside school. Uh, mostly inside school. There you go. Uh, but the intent is for this funding to serve as seed funding, seed funding for larger requests outside. So the NSF and other places have large scale grants of the order of $5 million or $10 million that they will award. But often you have to have done some prior, prior, prior work um, or preliminary work. And so this is meant to actually get some folks together who might be wanting to do this actually stimulate and, and, and see that work and then um, hopefully lead to these kinds of proposals going out. Um, and at the school level, back to sort of numbers of admissions, this is again um, a table where you see the number of freshmen admits in this particular case, or the, the number of freshmen who've accepted, um, and the number of transfer students who've accepted to each of the schools on campus. Um, and so ICS had 465 freshmen and 386 transfer students coming in, which actually matches the fourth largest school total on campus at this moment in time. When it started seven years ago, we were like the 12th lowest school. Um, and so the demand has just been enormous, and you'll see a little bit more of that later. At least the numbers are stable. Um, last year, there was again a 100% increase from the year before, so we, we all are feeling that there are more students in our classes. Um, at the undergraduate level, in red are the ones that are, um, you know, informatics related. And what we always see is that, you know, informatics had five freshmen coming in, 16 software engineering students, 40 computer game science, 16 business information management. And then we're sitting right next to computer science that had 300. So we always look small at the very beginning, especially with five students and maybe 15 transfer students. Um, but then when we actually look at the overall number of majors that will come later, um, you, you will see that um, we end up with many more majors because a lot of students end up transferring into our majors. So in terms of the total number of majors that we actually serve, it's about 700, and I'll show you that um, in a little bit. But this kind of difference is pretty typical. One of the things that we find is that many students in high school, they know the term computer science. They might know the term software engineering because that's what an uncle and aunt does. Um, but they don't necessarily believe that computer game science is something that is real. Um, business information management, that should be in the business school, and you know, informatics, we have never heard that term before. Um, so we're working on figuring out ways to actually advertise and educate the, the high school students a little bit better about the kinds of careers and the kinds of degree programs that exist. Um, so 
That's mostly it from the school level. I think I, I've been very happy with the support that's been coming towards the department from the dean's office. Um, we, we did an amazing amount of recruiting, as you see in a little bit. Um, there's support for space and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, you know, the schools are running, um, and the school is actually running quite well with the growing pains of how many students we have and, and how much recruiting has been happening. Um, at the department level, um, just going through personnel, some of you know David Kay. David Kay retired. Um, but then we have Hadar Ziv, who joined us as a uh, professor of teaching, Kimberly Hermans, who joined us as a new lecturer. Um, so both of them are, are quite focused at the undergraduate level, doing lots of teaching for us, because we certainly need to support that. Um, but then beyond, at the faculty level, um, and I know some of you are here, um, Kylie is here, I think I didn't see Josh or Daniel, but Roderick and Stacy and Iftikhar. So we hired six new faculty in the department this past year. I know a bunch of you actually helped with the recruiting. I'm, I'm looking at some faces and they're going, yeah, I was in those lunches as a grad student, or I, I was joining in that. Um, this is actually quite amazing. This doesn't happen every year. Um, this is very unusual that a single department brings in this many people at the same time. Um, and this is, you know, six on top of two over here. Um, and so we're very fortunate. It was a big effort, um, but they're here, and I've been super excited that they're here. I think they've been very active. I'm looking at one of them right there. Um, and so very active, very, very energetic. Um, we energize lots of conversations. Um, they have lots of energy for all of the students, you know. Many of them don't have a student yet, so you might want to think about that. Um, and. Uh, we're just very fortunate that they're here and very excited that they're here. Um, that was not all, though. We also, at the staff level, um, Connie Cheng, we have a new Master's of Software Engineering, um, where the first students will uh, enroll in uh, fall. And Connie is the program director for that, so we hired her. And then Debbie Brockbeck and Carrie Neese, and I thought I saw Debbie somewhere. Yeah, there she is. And Carrie, too, um, are joining us from ISR, which was the Institute for Software Research, which was an independent unit of campus. Um, Institutes on campus are meant to have a certain lifetime. Um, ISR was at the end of its lifetime, more or less, um, but ISR is important to the school and important to the department. Um, so through various ways of working, um, ISR has become a school center, and so it continues to exist, it continues to advertise itself, it continues to house events, and etc. cetera. Um, and so Debbie and Carrie no longer are sort of independent people on campus, but they're now more, more part of the school, and so we welcome them as well. Um, and then other department news, uh, Alfred Kopsa and Bonnie Nardi are retiring this year. Um, so they'll be retiring November 1st, which means that um, we again will have additional faculty openings in the upcoming years to, to replace them. Um, and so they're not quite gone yet. November 1st is the official date, so I'm going to uh, talk to them as much as I can before then. And then Alex, I, I think I promised I'll put your slide up. Um, so Alex uh, has joined the department as a presidential postdoctoral fellow, um, and I'm sort of singling that out um, because one of the things that happens um, in uh, the University of California system is, you know, there's always sort of the expectation in some ways that uh, if you're a grad student, if you go to academia, you, you know, either become a postdoc or you become a faculty member. There's this special program um, that the University of California and a couple of others have, which is called the Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow Program. Um, which is incredibly prestigious. Um, there's a large number of people apply, very few who get it. Um, but it's also incredibly supportive. Um, so what it does is it gives you two years of postdoc support, but then it also tells all of the UCs that if you want to hire this person, this presidential postdoctoral fellow program will pay five years of their salary, will pay a good chunk of their startup salary. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of sharing this story. A, Alex, amazing that you did that. <laughs> Um, but B, for all grad students, right, um, there's other paths than just jumping right into being a faculty position. This is one way um, to do that. And I know that the call is actually out right now, if I want to say. Um, so you know, if you're near graduation, it's something that you might, might want to look at. Um, and if not, something you can keep in mind for future years. Um, this is sort of more logistically important. Um, as the department has grown, so um, again, seven years ago we were below 20. This year we're at 30 faculty members. Um, seven years ago we were about 40, maybe 45 PhD students. This year we're about 85, possibly 90. Um, so we are just growing, and when you grow, that, that means there's you know, always more things to do. Uh, sometimes a lot more of the same, sometimes a lot more different. 
Um, so whereas in past years the department had a vice chair for undergraduate affairs, a vice chair for graduate affairs, um, and so Yunnan um, is our vice chair for undergraduate affairs, Melissa is our vice chair for graduate affairs, and I'm going to point to Melissa in just a second. Um, this year we also have a vice chair. Um, I wasn't allowed to call Bill in this case because he's agreed to do this, to be vice chair of something. Um, so he's just vice chair with nothing to do apparently. Um, <laughs> but that's okay, he's still helping. Um, and it's actually really great to have somebody for me to talk to and be able to interact about the many things that come my way. Um, but I just wanted to have Melissa sort of wave her hand for just a second because mostly here, many of you here are PhD or master's students. So she's our vice chair for graduate affairs. Um, she has office hours every Wednesday, I want to say It's from 10.30 10 to 12.30. Yes. If you need me outside those hours, just let me know. Um, right. But she they didn't say good luck. She said let me know. <laughs> <laughs> but the office hours do get full, so please feel free to email me ahead of time if you actually want to sit down and chat. But you can always come in if you need That's to right. sign something during that time. That's right. So, so anything graduate student related. Um, and especially if student affairs, student affairs is always a good place to go if you have curricular questions, you know, if you are wondering about prerequisites or all sorts of crazy things. Um, but if there's stuff that student affairs cannot resolve for you, or if you just want to talk as a grad student, or if you, you know, have questions about um, you know, what, it, what it might mean to switch advisors, you know, sometimes that happens. Um, Melissa is the kind of person to talk to, or is the kind of person is the person to talk to. Um, though I should also say, my, my door is always open, so I know a bunch of you have actually barge in, and that's exactly what I hope you do. So um, we, we're here to help you, and again, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, other than that, so this year we have one open position in human computer interaction and design. Um, so no 40 interviews in the department this year. Um, so this is actually a welcome relief. I think we, have, we all um, need, need a little breather and actually sort of work on getting everybody on board. There's one half FDE, it's a split position with emergency medicine that we're still working on trying to fill from last year's search. This is easily the slowest search I've ever been involved in, um, but it's still progressing, so I'm hoping that eventually there'll be positive news. Um, we're trying to figure out how to um, expand our staff a little bit. So there is an open staff position. We're trying to figure out what the best way is to fill that. Um, because again, we have a lot more people um, we can keep growing the number of grad students, we can keep growing the number of faculty, but if we don't grow the staff, it becomes harder for us to do the work that we do. Um, and then I also want to announce uh, the diversity ambassador. Is here? No. Nope. That's okay. She must be busy. Um, so the, dep the department last year, um, for the first time with support from the campus, um, organized itself to have what's called the diversity ambassador. It's a graduate student. Um, and it's an external facing position. So, so what this person does, they help, um, in this particular case, the Office of Access and Inclusion, which is a school office shared with the School of Engineering, um, to join and go to recruiting <coughs> events, um, to talk to individual students, um, to go to some what are called HBCUs, the institutions of diverse background, um, and to help us spread the word of the informatics. Um, and so last year we, we uh, trialed the, the position. Um, we learned a lot of things about what to do and what not to do um, that we're trying to put in place with, with Sarah this year. So Sarah might reach out to you and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to this place. Anybody want to go with me? Uh, those kinds of things, you know, uh, let, let, us, let her know. Um, and so her position is really one that, that's helping us um, recruiting sort of all of the students that, that we would like to be here um, at UCI. Um, Again, sort of with support from the dean's office, um, as we're grown, our fifth floor is really tight. Um, the number of offices is actually zero that is available at this moment in time. Um, and we continue to have more folks. So we have received an allocation of additional space in ICS-1. Um, the plan is to redesign it. Um, we're talking currently with some people from campus and outside on what that might actually look like. Um, the, the plan is for all of the software engineering students, faculty, visitors, and everybody else to have a space there so that they're all co-located because they're now in three different buildings, um, which is not always conducive to folks working together. Um, there also is a Master of Software Engineering program that the department has launched. It's a self-supporting program, so it's a little bit different than your typical uh, master program that's associated with the PhD program, which is more for research focused. Um, this Master's of Software Engineering is entirely 
industry focused. So it's, it's really focused on training students who might have a degree in something else, find themselves in the computing industry, and want to learn more about software engineering. Uh, and so it's finally fully approved after like two and a half years worth of effort, uh, and we'll be enrolling our first cohort this upcoming uh, fall. And it's one of the benefits that happens with these, this program is that whereas in the past we sort of had master students who wanted to do research, PhD students wanted to do research, and master students who really wanted to do learn more practical things, all in the same graduate classes. This has been one way for us to actually separate that a little bit better so that the students who want to do more practical things can be in the professional program, the students who want to do more researching kind of things can be in the uh, academic program. And that is, you know, much mimicking what we did with the informatics degree, where there's a PhD in informatics, master of informatics, and then a master of HCI in design, which is much more professionally oriented. Um, and then I think this is the last for the, for the department. The Connected Learning Lab is approved as a pre-ORU. So what's the Connected Learning Lab? Well, it's a group of faculty from our department and education that's dedicated to studying and mobilizing learning technologies in equitable, which I like really very much, innovative and learner-centered ways. And so it's all about learning, education, and technology, that interplay. Um, it's just like sort of ISR got absorbed um, out, of, out of ORU land, um, the, the CLL is sort of on its way to become an ORU. But the campus has a new program for doing that. They don't like to, they, they used to have a competition where folks would all compete and they got 30 proposals from campus and they picked two and they became an ORU. They're doing it now in a much more gradual, guided manner where you sort of become a pre-ORU first, which is a little funny because you're not an ORU with its own funding stream, so you're still sitting in the, in the school. Um, but you're getting some of the benefits of being, being this, this, this status on campus. Um, so this is, this is, in my book, actually a really good thing. It's, it's an effort across schools that's really gelling, um, and I, I expect to see a lot of great things coming out of that. So what is our undergraduate enrollment? I said, yeah, we have about 700 uh, students, so 255 <coughs> in informatics, 176 in software engineering, 228 in computer game science, 127 in business information management. This one is always lower because it's capped by uh, campus, um, so there's only so many students who come in per year. It's interesting to put that in context next to computer science, which has 2,000 majors, computer science and engineering, 165, although I bet you that number is higher, um, and data science, which is the newest major in the school, which has 100 um, undergrads in it at this moment in time. What is interesting to see, though, is what, what's been sort of the percentage over the past five years in terms of growth. And actually, so BIM is down 11%, but that's noise because it's really been stable the past three years. Computer game science is up 41%, but again, that's noise. Um, it's more or less been stable the last four years. Computer science, though, is up 300%. Um, and so, so our, our neighbors downstairs, um, they're really feeling that there's an awful lot of students who really want to learn computing. Um, now, many of them actually do trickle in our courses. So if you, if you are a TA for the intro HCI course, or the software design course, or the intro software engineering course, um, you know, the intro software engineering course has about running about 1,500 students per year through that particular course. Um, and that's partly because it's a breadth course, partly because there's a lot of um, computer science students, and partly because we have our own students coming through as well. Um, but it's, it's really amazing to see this number. And it, it's, it's um, you know, for the school, it represents a very significant expansion um, that is quite tough to manage um, in five years, right? Think about it five years. With, well, uh, 500 students to 2,000 students in that program. And the others are more or less stable, even soft engineering. You know, in five years, okay, we went up 234% because that's just when it started, but it's been pretty stable these past two years. Graduate programs, we have been growing our grad program. Um, so you won't see it here, 58, 57, 23, 21. Um, but again, you know, six, seven years ago, our graduate program was maybe 40 students. Um, we now have 87, Melissa, 86, 85. Maybe between 85 and 87, depending yes. on how so, it makes So it varies per day. <laughs> um, so, because some, apparently some people are able to join late and some people are able to leave midterm somewhere. Um, but that is a big change for us. That, that's a lo much larger number of A mouths to feed on the one hand, but also um, making sure that, you know, everybody has the right advisor, everybody's working with whom they want to work with, everybody's advancing at the right time, all those kinds of things. And so. It will grow a little bit more still, um, is my bet, because we have more faculty, so we have more capacity to advise. 
at the master's level, you have 30, about 30 software engineering master's students, about 12 in informatics, and then 34 students in the master of HCI in design um, coming in this year. So um, about 80 master's students. And again, it's interesting to put that next to computer science or uh, network systems or stats. Um, so our numbers are, are fairly similar um, per faculty member in this case. So those of you who know, um, you know, that's sort of the update on the department. And as I said, I'm always welcome to have all sorts of questions about all sorts of things. But I do like to sort of look back on the year and say, so, so what did we all kind of accomplish? We accomplished an awful lot. Um, so I highlighted a few here. There's certainly not hundreds and hundreds that I'm going to go through because I know that we want to get the social hour. Um, but sort of a diverse set of things. So, so one is Judy Olson was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Um, which is an amazing feat, an amazing accomplishment, an, an amazing honor. Um, and actually it was just last week um, that she actually got fully inducted where there was a dinner and a celebration um, over on the East Coast. Um, but so for, for her to, to receive that is, is great recognition for the kinds of things she's contributed uh, in her field. This is Jeff Bunker. He's currently uh, on a sabbatical somewhere, sabbatical or leave. Uh, in Norway at a Norwegian institute that really wanted him to spend some time there. Um, he is, uh, per his medal, a chancellor's professor, and so this was at his talk in this very same room last year, um, and that's our Dean Mario is actually congratulating him at this point. And again, it's a recognition on campus of the kinds of things that we do, um, and acknowledging um, that the kinds of things we do are actually important, um, and, and so happy with that. Um, Bonnie Nardi, uh, received a test of time award uh, for one of her papers in uh, the Computer Support Cooperative Work um, Conference. These test of time awards, and if you actually go back through my presentations, every year we get some of those. Um, it, it's, a, it's a recognition of something that you wrote like 10 years ago, and you know, we notice that it still has, time, has impact at this moment in time, or it, it was highly cited, or, or, or. And so um, she received that, that recognition for one of her papers in this past year. Um, Krista and Bo, uh, we, uh, the campus usually every year um, announces a number of awards. So Krista received an award for um, undergraduate teaching, Bo received an award for mentoring of undergraduate students as researchers. Um, and so we actually don't just um, focus on the grad students, we also engage all the undergrads. Um, and we don't just focus on research, we actually really like our teaching part of our job as well. It's important that we do that. Um, this is a non-person, non-informatics person, but I wanted to, to put her up anyways. This is Sharnia Artis. Um, she received uh, recognition as, and I want to read this just to make sure, a rising star in diversity. So she's actually the school's assistant dean um, for the Office of Access and Inclusion. And so the Office of Access and Inclusion, as I said earlier, our, our graduate student divers, uh, diversity ambassador is um, associated with that office. And so Sharnia was recognized as for all the effort she's been doing and how she's not been just doing that for the school and for the individual departments, um, but also actually for the community more broadly. Um, and she's amazing to work with, um, and actually for all the faculty who's writing NSF proposals or other kinds of proposals, there's a whole bunch of programs that she's been mounting between ICS and engineering um, that would fit the broader impacts category of those kinds of proposals. And so I encourage you to talk to her. Um, and we were talking to her this morning together with Sarah um, about the plans we have for diversity ambassador. Grants are always important, um, so I list just a few of them. Uh, so Crystal Lopes got a grant, and that was awarded, uh, announced just like two days ago. Uh, 1.1 million with UCLA for a normalized job or resource. Uh, Gloria Mark was part of a project um, that attracted $8 million together with a number of other universities. Uh, Sam Malik and Yo Garcia, Josh Garcia, um, also got an award, $1.66 million for um, an infrastructure for software architecture. Um, Kurt and Constance um, got a $744,000 grant for Tenacity, we're looking at self-regulation of attention and its relationship to learning. Um, and then I can keep going. Paul Durish, um, it's almost official, I think, at this moment. It's kind of official, right? It's official. Yeah, it's official. Um, so this is an incredibly important grant, actually. Um, so the department for the past two years, um, we've had what's called a GAN grant. And the GAN grant is Graduate Assistance in the Area of National Need. Um, so it's not tied, more or less, to any specific research topic that a faculty member is doing. 
but it says, oh, informatics is producing graduates in an area of national need. Here is $885,000 by which you can fund seven PhD students. And there's no requirement that they work on a particular project. There's no requirement that they um, you know, work with a particular faculty member. It's a departmental resource. And what actually happens is there is a 25% cost share from the campus, so the number becomes larger yet. Um, and it turns out that we're often able to slice and dice it. So about 10 or 12 students almost um, yearly are on this particular grant. And so when we think about everybody needing funding, right, as PhD students especially, um, this kind of grant is incredibly important because it can be used fairly flexibly, although it comes with a ton of rules and regulations and FAFSA forms that you have to fill out a bunch of other stuff. Um, but from the perspective of keeping all our PhD students funded, which we definitely care about, um, this, is, this is phenomenal that we have another one coming in. It's a little funny, as Paul observed, um, that the existing one goes for another year, and this one starts right now. Um, so we have sort of two grants competing to get people on it, but we'll figure out how to do that. Um, Matt Beats, just to give you sort of a, 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 an overview of diversity of kinds of topics, pervasive data ethics for computational research, $3 million um, with other universities. Deborah Richardson um, did a grant on <coughs> teaching high school uh, teachers on how to actually teach computer science, because computer science is now an AP topic there. And then Hadar Ziff um, got a grant together with one of our alumni in Indiana, uh, Samir Patel, um, on cybersecurity learning with undergraduate capstone courses. And so you, you can sort of see the variety of, of kinds of things. There, there's other grants that could have listed in healthcare, um, in education, in games. Um, so stuff happens, um, and this is one of the ways in which the faculty support the research that, that goes on here. Um, and then, I, then I'll switch to a, a, a sort of miscellaneous set of things. So this is not quite a grant, but it's, a, it's still a, a support for the university. Um, so this is the local eSports arena. Um, and what you're seeing is the event where high schools were competing as part of a league of high school eSports um, that Constance Steinkuller has, together with other faculty in the department and elsewhere, um, has been working on significantly to to put together, but not just so the students can just play. Actually, there's curriculum attached to it. And so the idea is that the students have an interest in esports, but through, the, through that interest, drawing them back into the curriculum and actually teaching them a bunch of things. Um, and that is off the ground with, I want to say, a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of um, uh, schools in the OC. Um, and is now actually being pushed, and I'm kind of looking at current nationwide, right? It's not even let's go OC state, let's go nation. It's just like OC national, right? Yeah. Yeah. I believe continent actually, North America. <laughs> I mean, I see. <laughs> we're in Orange County. Why, why bother to go small? I guess. Okay. But yeah, but we, there, there, there are a couple of statewide things happening though. There is a statewide sort of push, including some statewide courses to get in, into high schools across the state. What else would you? But yeah, and it, one of the things I'm kind of excited about, I mean, is it possible like an East Coast, West Coast rivalry thing people are kind of interested in trying to do? So that, mm -hmm. that might be one of the first things to happen. Okay. So, um, but what's particularly nice about this is, is that it's, it's not supported by a grant, it's actually supported by a gift. It's a foundation that's bankrolling, it's a significant chunk of, of this effort. Um, and so having support not just from um, traditional funding agencies, but also from companies, and, and fundraising through these kinds of ways is important. Um, and just as another example, uh, so this is uh, Stu Sutton, um, that's David Redmouse, he's a professor here, Stu is a friend of the, the university. Um, David has been teaching the visualization course, um, and Stu has uh, been supporting us by actually getting all of the students' licenses to Tableau and a bunch of other software, which if we were to actually having to purchase that, um, would represent a significant outlay, um, but he, as a friend of the school, actually helped us get the licenses um, for, you know, it's worth probably a couple hundred thousand dollars, which the students are now using for free. Um, and so it's these kinds of things that we, that, you know, I care about as department chair, um, aligning the support outside the school so that we can do what we need to do. Um, other examples here, so this is actually uh, the Anteater Learning Pavilion, um, and uh, now it's called the ALP. I immediately placed my European mind in the Alps in Europe, and I could not understand that they were talking about the learning pavilion. Uh, now I do. 
Um, so what I want to highlight here is that one of the things that we do extremely well as a department is the capstone courses. So our capstone courses in the software engineering major, in the informatics major, and in the computer game science major. Um, so in the informatics and software engineering, it attracts a ton of corporations, um, companies that have projects, that want to work with students, and that in this particular case, they're in an ADAR, um, or the two instructors who run that, that project course, um, to the T actually, and there's a celebratory event at the end. Um, we now get some family to show up to actually see their, their kids, you know, and, and what amazing things they've done. Um, and then this, as I said, is the learning pavilion, and this is the computer game science course as it started, uh, I want to say, a couple days ago. Um, and so what you see actually here is sort of the whole flexible operation. You press a button, there's actually a monitor that comes out of the table. Um, you can huddle in, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and the capstone course, too, you know, attracts about 25 mentors from industry. So from the local industry, from the local games industry. And they commit to coming here twice every other week to work with the students. And so it generates sort of a really nice community for us to work in. Um, so to, to, to keep things relevant for the students and real for the, for the students as well. Um, and this is one other example, and I know some of you were actually involved in it, and I just want to highlight again. So this person here, um, his name is Tim Kashani. Um, Tim is an alum uh, from our school. Um, Tim did uh, mentoring, uh, did IT teaching. Um, and did mentoring for, for corporations. He did so well that eventually he actually said, you know, I like this mentoring thing, but I actually like Broadway better. Um, and so he's one of the producers of An American in Paris, um, which won a Tony Award, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm not. And so he's been coming back to our school and saying, you know, there's lots of cool stuff that I would like to play with at the intersection of the arts, the performing arts, and technology. Okay. Um, and so he actually co-taught with Josh, and these are just some pictures from that, um, a course last year, which was very much like a capstone course, um, where um, you know Tim was there, again, every other week or every week, and he was actually flying back and forth from the East Coast to be part of this, um, where they played with virtual reality, and they played with the design of scenes, uh, set design, and they played with virtual experiences. Um, and this went so well that Tim is going to be back this year. Is going to continue doing some research with Josh, and there's going to be another team of students working through this. Um, and the nice thing, again, is it, it makes things very relevant. It makes things very, very exciting. I also like to celebrate our students. This is Rihanna. Um, so she received the Google Fellowship. Um, and so this ties into something that I'll say later, and I'll say it now as well. Um, again, with, with funding always be a concern for the department, um, and we've always funded all of our students and we'd like to continue that tradition. One of the things that we look at is what are the ways in which we can do so. So there's some internal fellowships that the that, that campus has to which we always apply for our new students, um, but then also outside support. So Google fellowships, uh, Microsoft fellowships, uh, you know, Facebook fellowships, and we would actually like it if you could apply. Because if you do apply, there's two things that might happen. So one is some of these fellowships actually are top of fellowships. So we still support you, but you get more money or you get something else. Um, some of them replace what we provide, but they typically give you more anyways. Okay. Um, and so that's a way that you can have support um, and somebody else can have support um, because you don't necessarily need department funds at that moment in time. Um, so what we like to do is, and especially this year, but, but always, we want to help you as much as we can putting those fellowships together. Um, so I've said it every year, but again this year, I will read any application that you do for any of these fellowships. All you got to do is send it my way. Um, I was on the campus selection committee for the Google Fellowship, so I looked at all the ones that were being submitted from all the departments, got to participate in selecting the two that went forward, um, and so I do that for a number of them, and so I have a decent sense of what goes in them. And also for those of you who are writing letters of recommendation, um, I also see the differences in letter of recommendations. So for all you faculty who write them, um, I can give feedback on what might work or what might not work. I'm not absolutely right, absolutely not. Um, but I've seen a lot of them, and I can help um, in that process. And I know Melissa is equally committed as vice chair to say, look, these are not just things that keep everybody funded, but actually for you, it's an amazing recognition that you get one of these fellowships. Right? It's something that you put in your resume. It's something that often leads to working relationships with the organization. Some of them actually end up working at the organization. And even if you don't, you still have that fellowship on your, on your resume. Um, so 
you know, Rihanna is just one example in this particular case. Um, Mustafa, I think you are here. Um, so Mustafa um, was a teaching fellow this year for what's called the I3 Inclusion Institute, uh, which is run out of Pittsburgh. Um, and so it's a diversity-focused effort that yearly builds a new cohort of students and then uses students from the member organizations to do a whole lot of programming. Um, and so Mustafa was one of, the, one of the folks who got elected to help with the programming and be part of the mentoring network for these students. Um, and this is Oliver um, Heimson, who now is actually graduated and is now a postdoc at Michigan onto a faculty position, and Marie Sasson. Um, both of them got internal fellowships from the campus. And neither, neither of these fellowships is fantastically rich. Okay? We're not winning the lottery. Um, but at the same time, you know, these fellowships do come by, and I know they come by because I get the email messages, I know you get the email messages, and there's a ton of them, right? Um, but look at them carefully and see which ones you might be able to apply for, and we're happy to help you. Um, and then last but not least, Sam McDonald. Um, she got an NSF uh, Graduate Research Fellowship um, out, out last year, um, and that's a three-year fellowship, three years worth of funding from the National Science Foundation. Again, highly prestigious. Um, we probably get, on average, one, one and a half per year per department, uh, but by department for us, um, and we'd like to continue that tradition. So I know that um, in Informatics 201, all of you who are um, in that course will get to practice writing one of these. Um, it's still now, this year, you know, you have to decide whether you want to submit in your first year or your second year, so you should talk to your advisor um, about what the right time is, then, you know, happy to talk to us as well. But the idea is sort of everybody who is eligible should think about submitting there because it's not only a great recognition, it's also a way of actually for you to articulate what your research is. And I think you know well uh, what, what that means, right? You, you, you have to be precise. You have to actually summarize what you're doing in two pages or less. All right, and, and the last but not least, so uh, while the campus is very keen on everybody graduating on time, um, this is probably one of the folks who graduated the slowest. Um, but to just share that there's some hope for you, <laughs> even if that happens. Uh, so this is Artie Thomey. This is called the Ingenuity Award. Um, so this year, Artie Thomey, one of, one of long-term PhD students, but also a long-term friend of uh, the department, um, received the Ingenuity Award, which is in recognition partly for what folks have gone outside, so he's the CEO of a company called uh, Numacent, which is doing very well, um, and is doing all sorts of infrastructure development for instant delivery of games and other kinds of infrastructure on your computer, um, and, but also who are friends of the school and support the school, and you know, so are to serve on the school's leadership council, has chaired it, and a bunch of other kinds of things, and so um, just, you know, we have fabulous alumni, uh, and it's nice to celebrate them at times. So what's in it for the year ahead? So I have only a few minutes left, um, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker than, than I than anticipated. That's OK. Six things, undergrad programs, community building, graduate experience. I suspect you care about that budget space. You don't care about that. What's next? Um, we'll see. So um, on the undergraduate programs, we are going to do a computer game science refresh. Actually, it's well underway. Katie Saban is leading this. It's much needed. Um, it's been a shared program with computer science through mutual agreement computer science is going to have a track We're going to have a full program um, It's no longer going to be called computer game science. It's going to be called game design and interactive media um, Which fits our department a lot better uh, Allows us to build a much nicer program as well the informatics program at the undergraduate level um, I woke up one day and I said boy. It's 14 years old and we haven't changed very much um, so is also going to get a fresh look. What does an informatics program look like in 2018 or 19? Um, and we also need to look at business information management, but we have said let's do this one first in our, our breath course. So one of the things that the department will be engaging on is a lot of curricular design at the undergraduate level. Um, for community building, uh, we had a retreat you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, with the faculty and the visitors. So, uh, with the faculty, um, but I'm speaking sort of to the, to the bottom two where I talked at the retreat already with the faculty about this, right? We have grown, um, and so we're no longer the small department that could. We're now a large department with 30 faculty, as I said, you know, almost 90 PhD students. And so it's important that we pay attention to our efforts to actually know each other, understand what folks are doing, um, be able to support each other, and et cetera. So at the student level, what, what might that mean, right? 
Um, so one of the things about building community that I know is you know, being in the office and being in the lab actually matters. So I walk around, I visit the labs, um, and that's actually kind of fun. I get to know a bunch of people, I get to know what they're doing. Um, but you also get to know your lab mates, and you get to know the people in the other lab. So, so one of the things that I ask is, you know, if you're here and you're doing research, think about actually spending some time here. It's often easier for you to do it by yourself at home. Um, that holds for the faculty as well. Um, but actually, by being here, I can guarantee you that you'll have more ideas, more opportunities to interact, more opportunities to ask for advice, etc. So, so just think about that. Um, and maybe ask another student what they're up to, maybe in your group or another group. Offer to help with something. Come to the colloquia like you do now, the social hour, the coffee hour, etc. They are there for you to get to know everybody. Um, and, and I know that you know tomorrow, I'm having lunch with somebody who was a grad student while I was in Boulder. Um, and he just looked me up and said, going to be in the area, let's go. Um, and I think that's the kind of network that you start building. Um, I know that I rely a lot on that network all the time. Um, and so you, sh you should take advantage while you're here um, to build that for yourself. Um, on that note, I'm also happy to support initiatives. So as chair, I have a budget. It's not very big, but still, it's a little bigger than what it used to be. So if you all have thoughts about initiatives that would lead to community building, community kind of activities, we know we support ICSA already a little bit. Um, we're happy to support things that you're thinking about. Okay, so, so just let me know. Um, staff. So, uh, community for staff, we have a small staff. Okay, as a department, we have a couple of core folks. Um, that staff has equally seen a significant increase in work, uh, both in terms of volume, so just more people can do more things, uh, but also in terms of tedium. The university has tightened some rules here and there, and that's meant that things have become more tedious for them to deal with. Um, and a bunch of things have changed. So they're in a precarious situation at times. So they're being the messenger um, telling you that, no, you can't do that, and I need this approval, and no, you need to do it this way. Um, whereas we, of course, want to try to get our work done. So, so the advice is the more you can actually ask for help early, I'm going to travel, right, or I need to purchase something, um, go talk to them first and see how you, you know, what the best way of doing that is. Because often there's an easy way, and often there's a complicated way. And, and trust me, the easy way is much easier than the complicated way. Um, and so keep in mind that they're there. Um, also keep in mind, we are currently assessing staff needs in the department, so we're taking this, this growth as an opportunity to look at what we can do um, and what the best ways of supporting all that we, we're trying to achieve. Um, and so we thank them for what they do, uh, but, and we know that we give them lots of work. All right, graduate experience. That's the one I wanted to talk about um, for just a little bit. So there's two things that have plopped in your inbox um, these past few days, I want to say. Uh, the first one, actually, I think that came in a second, but still. Um, the first one is what's called the Independent Development Plan. So the campus, this is the campus, this is coming down from graduate division, um, wants every PhD student, as I understand it, not necessarily master's student, but PhD, PhD student, um, to fill out what's called the Independent Development Plan. Um, so it's a form. It looks kind of a little bit like the form that we use for your annual review, but it's a little bit different. So the annual review looks back, says, what have you been doing? The independent development plan looks forward and says, what do you think you want to be doing this particular year? Um, and so the way this is meant to work is you're meant to fill it out, and you're meant to bring it to your advisor, either by email or you talk to them, um, and then you're meant to have a, have a conversation. So what it's meant to do is actually avoid um, mismatches in expectations and actually force the conversation between you and your advisor. Um, as a department, we actually do pretty good in our faculty talking with our students and understanding the mutual expectations, um, but it's my understanding that that's not true for every department around campus. And so um, this has come down from graduate division as a practice that is meant to your benefit um, so that that conversation is always there and you know what to expect for the upcoming. And along the same lines, if you're involved in independent research, sort of what's called a 299 or 298, those are the courses that we use for that, um, now it is mandatory that the expectations are explicit. And so um, one of the things that used to happen around campus at times is that a faculty member goes, you know, yeah, this person is in my 299 and fills out an A at the end. And then the next quarter, they end the 299 and they fill out an A 
And then the third quarter, they need 299 to fill out an A. And then over summer, they decided they don't want student anymore because student is no good. Um, and so the campus goes, well, hold on. Uh, you know, you've been filling out an A and an A and an A. This, this student is actually really good. What do you mean? He goes through this is no good. Um, and so to make sure that, again, that conversation happens um, to your benefit so that everybody understands what's going on, um, now, when you are in a 299 or 298, you can expect to be talking to your faculty members so that there's a little bit of an articulation of what um, is expected for you for this particular quarter. And that's actually meant to be done by the second week of the quarter. So, so for all of you in 299s, um, somewhere in the upcoming seven days, you and your advisor uh, need to do this. Um, we're also working on graduate courses refresh, particularly in the informatics PhD. Um, there too, we're trying. We're actually trying to do this slightly differently than the typical. Let's take a bunch of courses down. Let's put a bunch of courses up. Um, we're trying to float a few 295s, sort of different kind of topics, um, and see how you respond to them. I already talked about fellowship nominations, um, and then again, you know, in terms of the graduate student experience, as we've grown. Um, it's become a little bit harder for Lewis and I to know every single PhD student as well as we would know them when there's 30 or 40. Um, and so to facilitate actually hearing your concerns, to facilitate hearing your suggestions, um, we had a first town hall last spring. We will have another town hall this year, of uh, this year, I mean this quarter, and it's November 9th, is that right? So on November 9th, um, we'll provide lunch for all your PhD students and ourselves. Um, and Melissa and I will be there to, to just talk with you and hear from you what's, what's up, what is on your mind. Um, we valued the previous one a lot. It has actually led to some things that we've been working on. Um, and so we're going to continue those and put those as a continuous um, agenda item twice a year. Um, there will be a suggestion box. Um, so for those of you who don't necessarily want to walk into our office and say what's going on, we prefer to do it more anonymously. Um, last year, the suggestion box worked great for the town hall. We got to have lots of topics to talk about. Um, you should feel free to put things in there. It's going to be around the middle room area. It's not quite up yet, but it, you know, for those of you who know my red hat, it's a red mailbox. Is it in there? Um, it's, I bought the red Oh. Yes. And it's 1519. Pardon me? 1519, that's the room number. Yeah, 1519. So, um, and it's bright red, can't miss it. Um, and we'll periodically open it and go from there. So, um, but the point is, um, we're here to help. So, so we want to hear from you what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I know Melissa said, you know, my office hours, they've been busy. That's good in, in many ways to us, right? We're hearing from you what's going on, and, and we want to help you succeed in your studies. And that's it. We, we're actually, um, this is one we're noticing more, well-being. Um, so just your well-being as a student, and for our faculty and staff as well, our own well-being as well. Um, for those of you who know, know me, you know, sometimes you see me riding in on a road bike. Um, that's very deliberate. Right? I, I actually get some downtime, I get some thinking time, I get some exercise. Um, it's very deliberate on my part that I do that. Partly, I'm Dutch, so it, it's in, in the genes. Um, but partly, I force myself. Right? I, I need to do this because I know that on those days that are right, things go, always go a little bit better. Um, and so we also know that the graduate program is not necessarily free of stress. Um, it's not necessarily a cakewalk. Um, and so we know and have been in your shoes that sometimes things go well and sometimes things don't go well. Um, and we just want to remind you that you know, your personal well-being, taking care of yourself, um, not getting completely drowned in work, um, and only doing work is actually an important part of being in a PhD or master's program. So um, for yourself, you know, we're here to listen, we're here to talk. There's a counseling center on campus, there's a student affairs office, um, there's your lab mates, there's your faculty advisor. Um, it's sort of, you know, if something is up, let us know. It's often much better for us to know that something isn't going well early than that you're trying to solve it yourself for a really long time and then it doesn't really work and then we're trying to unroll that you had a couple of incompletes and a withdrawal and a couple of other things, right? It's much easier for us to be proactive in that regard. Um, and as always, you know, see something, say something. It does happen, we're larger now. It does happen that somebody sometimes isn't doing well, okay? Reaching out to them and saying, hey, can I do something for you? Or if you're not comfortable with that, coming to us and saying, hey, you know, so-and-so's been having some behaviors that are not typical. 
um, let us know. It's just something that I think we, we just need to be mindful of. And not just for you, the students in the lab or the students on the floor, also the students in our classes. Many of us are going to be TA, um, and you're going to be sort of the primary point of contact for a number of the undergrads that are coming through. Um, if you see something that's unusual, let the faculty member know. Okay. I have walked personally, and I know some other faculty as well, have talked to students and then walked them afterwards to the counseling center because they needed the help. Okay. That's not to say that we're in a dramatic, crazy kind of state. That, that happens every day. Um, but certainly, as a campus right now, um, we want to be very mindful of this. And I just want to want to remind everybody that sort of life-work balance is something that, in the end, um, is important. So last couple of items, the budget. Um, so our budget is changing. The budget model is changing. Um, it's towards more autonomy as a department, um, which means that you know, we are more responsible for our own income um, and our own expenditures. But overall, it's actually looking up in terms of non-pre-allocated uh, funds. So this is why one of the things I'm saying is, you know, I'm happy to entertain still small ideas. You know, I don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around to do things easily. Um, but as people have suggestions or want to do something that they believe will make the department a better place, come talk to us. Okay. Um, and so this should look up more in the upcoming years because of some of the things that we've done. Um, so I'm, I'm positive here, though of course there's always plenty of expenditures that all of a sudden get put in your budget at a certain moment in time. And then finally, uh, space. There is the allocation of space to be furnished in ICS-1, so that's a space that we're going to be able to occupy. Um, but we will still see um, a push on space with additional staff, for instance, right? If we get one or two additional staff, they also need that replaced. Um, and then I sort of want to put a challenge in front of people. I've been looking at that lobby for too long. Um, so if people have an idea of what to do with that, or what we can do with that, um, I would take those kinds of ideas. Because can we have something that's more welcoming, a little bit community oriented, or we could just pop down and sit for a little bit? Um, I'd happily take suggestions. Um, so what's next? You know, what's informatics going to look like 2023, 2028? I don't know. Um, but like we did five, six, seven years ago and got together and said, here's where we sort of want to go, we're now in a new phase. And so the faculty will once again be talking about how do we move forward, what's our next sort of growth opportunity as a department. And so to wrap up, I've always been asked, get your gear. Um, you know, if you buy a mug, it actually goes to IXA. The little 20 cents that are earned goes to the Informatic Drive <laughs> Student Association. Um, so, so if you want some, all good. Um, and I checked last night, it actually is still alive. I think this website is just sitting there for year after year after year. Um, Facebook and Twitter, uh, we put news out. Um, and then there's the upcoming seminar series. Next week we have an eSports expert panel, and then we have a whole bunch of uh, distinguished visitors coming. So I hope to see many of you here um, every Friday at 2. And that's it. So if anybody has questions, really quick, but I know we're running late, so let's go downstairs, because the mission is that we ask the questions of the speaker downstairs. <laughs> All right, thank you.